Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Today, we're going to focus on navigating site selection and startup with specific tailoring to small biotech pharma companies in oncology trials and how to get them to the front of the line. I'm Quinn Zrubik, the Director of Project Management and Eclinical Operations here at Axiom Real-Time Metrics, and I'm joined with my colleague, Jazz. Hi, everyone. I'm Jazz Chahal, and I'm the Associate Director within the Clinical Management Department. We're currently celebrating at Axiom our 20th anniversary, so we've been around providing services for EDC, data management, RTSM, including CTM tracking, randomization, cohort management, you name it. TTMS features ePro, and then along with that to complement is a lot of managed services as well uh, that we've been providing for 20 years now. Today, we're going to focus on executing oncology trials. So some of the items that we're going to touch on for the key uh, challenges and solutions are rethinking site feasibilities from a traditional paper method to alternative methods to better catch the interest of uh, these participating sites. Looking at faster, more robust startup processes. And then, of course, touching on key technology solutions and overall benefits of a unified platform for these start act activities leading up to the first patient in. So now let's look at some of those key challenges. You have multiple competing trials in the same indication. If you go to clinicaltrials.gov, for example, and uh, do a search for non-small cell lung cancer, you're going to see over a thousand different trials currently ongoing. Um, all competing for the same patient population. So how do you get an edge within that competitive landscape, being a small or a medium-sized biotech company? There are multiple feasibility questionnaires going to the same institutions. Often institutions will use the name brand or prior experience to triage whether they can have the feasibilities and the resources to participate in your trial. So how do we get your feasibility to the front of the line? Moreover, how do we get your compelling drug data for your investigational drug in the hands of the treating physician? Along with feasibilities is the line of a, a choice in site selection. If you don't have a robust site pool, you will not have the choice of, of having the best sites and therefore having the best enrollment for your trial. Um, all of these challenges pose a significant impact to the trial timelines. Again, if you don't have all of the sites up and running in this particular amount of time, you are at risk of getting your first patient in on time. So now let's go through some of those challenges in a, in a deep dive, and then let's look at the solutions. So let's look at the feasibility questionnaire in more detail. Over the last 20 or 30 years, in my experience, it's been a very two-dimensional, three-page PDF document that goes out in a mass email distribution. It has very limited visibility into your investigational drug data, um, how well it will work in this patient population. But moreover, it doesn't have any insight into who you are as a biotech company, how do you differentiate yourself from the larger pharma companies out there when you're all competing for the same indication and that same patient population? So one solution is the feasibility video. So we're no longer in a two-dimensional fashion. Now we're in a three-dimensional, more visual concept of how your drug works within this patient population. Now treating physicians and your potential investigators have a better insight into how well your drug could potentially work for their patients. We can work with your research team and effectively present your research data in this exciting format. No longer the usual paper uh, format where it goes to a research coordinator and it gets uh, declined participation almost immediately. Now sites are less likely to right, decline participation when they're going through multiple IRB community, uh, sorry, uh, rather um, uh, um, uh, internal review committees 
and where they have the potential to say, no, we don't to participate. Now we have the buy-in from those uh, treating physicians to push forward all the way to, to site initiation. All of these tools now can help better with startup timelines and getting your first patient in that much sooner. I know I'd rather see a video, Jazz, than a two-page document in my inbox. Absolutely. <laughs> so once we have the feasibilities done, there are some other challenges that sites um, face in deciding whether they want to participate in a clinical trial. Um, they're faced with complex protocols with multiple vendors. Um, is training going to be involved? And is that support readily available? So they're going to look at their current staff. Do they need to hire more? Is the sponsor willing to provide additional training? How complex is that training? Um, and getting through the startup period, what is the ongoing support that they're willing to provide? Or is this complex trial just gonna burn out my existing staff and um, uh, result in turnover? Yeah, and some of the small but impact, impactful things to consider are um, being able to provide direct access to trainers. Um, so trainers or the sponsor staff to be able to answer any questions. So um, something that we see at Axiom is having live training um, with those trainers. So um, getting on those Zoom meetings or GoTo meetings or whatever it is in the forum, but having that live training. So being able to have a Q&A, answer questions, especially when you're looking at complex oncology studies and there are questions, um, having that access right away. So there's also things like customer service, our customer care team, so available 24-7. So instead of logging a ticket and waiting for a response within 24 hours, um, a lot of these questions can be addressed or appropriately triaged um, to the right individual to be able to get those answers right away. So being able to provide that support and showing the sites that we can support them. Another item to consider is easy to use platforms. Of course, I'm gonna talk about Fusion as a unified eClinical solution. Um, we have one login for EDC, IWRS, ePro. Um, a lot of the key features and technology requirements that are needed. So instead of uh, needing to remember five different logins, um, where you're going to access certain information. So this is from the sponsor side, and this is also from the site. Um, so kind of a key feature that we can talk about uh, looking into feasibility is um, kind of pushing along that information and that knowledge to the sites that we're able to provide this in a really easy format with the training resources behind them. So in the end, reduces the need for more resources because we can get quicker answers um, and support the sites in that kind of a way. That's great. And looking at now our um, an additional challenge we face is just is site selection and then the startup timeline. So typically it can take six to 12 months to get sites activated, a very lengthy process. We've lost almost a year just in, in the startup phase. Um, along with IRB and EC approvals and your contract and budget timelines, what can compound those overall, uh, that overall startup phase is your complex training programs. That can um, be uh, that much more lengthy and just delay your, your, your final um, uh, site initiation visits. Another thing that can compound um, the activation timelines is having multiple vendors over multiple access platforms. So getting your sites access to these different uh, vendors and tracking all that information and completing various tr uh, training for each individual tra uh, vendor is not only cumbersome, but can slow everything right down. Um, for not only your trial, but getting your first patient in as well. Yeah, and it's a huge kind of selling feature when you're trying to get these sites on board, having a, a great program to be able to kind of display to them why, why they want to work on this study. So now let's look at the, the database of sites. So we have access to hundreds of sites to choose from by indication. <clears throat> we have access to their IRB and EC timelines. 
we have access to their budget and template uh, budget and contract templates, thereby making the startup phase that much more efficient and um, and getting to site initiation that much faster. Um, we can also tailor sites so to fit the the nuances of your of your trial and some of the needs that come with being a small or medium sized biotech company. And finally, we can visualize the entire startup process um, for you um, site by site so that you can see where every site is within the startup phase and then address any risks that come with it. So to add to that, looking at reducing manual work. So we want to make everybody's lives more efficient. Um, because really we want our first patient in as soon as we can, um, and then also help with the burden of the sites in terms of their um, adoption for the, for the study and, and engagement in working in the study. So having a collection of the feasibilities electronically, um, so faster, more accurate decisions on the site selection. Um, so from that biotech pharma standpoint, the sponsor side, access to the feasibility data in real time in a platform like Fusion. On the other side, regulatory tracking. So the regulatory documents, the statuses, the submission timelines, an overall big picture of what do these sites look like, what phases are they in, who's pending responses to what, um, just really allow us to get uh, a lot closer and faster to that SPI. Leading into this, um, talking about a rapid study startup process. So uh, we've seen this really effective with a lot of studies, not necessarily just oncology studies, uh, but overall putting in these defined timelines uh, within the study startup process. So it means responses from the site, responses back from the, the CRO or the sponsor as well, and adhering to those timelines. Having an integrated CTMS for regulatory tracking, the collection of the reg docs, um, and obviously a unified platform that gives you pre-screening data and enrollment stats um, and all of those CTMS features then allows us the visibility into what's pending. So is there something that's, that's a, a bottleneck and a risk for us to get these sites up and running? So having real-time visibility into that makes it a lot more efficient. Um, there's also some really great um, I don't even call them nice to haves anymore. I call them must haves, but more notifications that are required. So if something's pending and a status hasn't been updated in terms of um, uh, responding back to a site and providing an updated document uh, for their review, notifications can go out based on some outstanding items. So really making everybody efficient and really facilitating a rapid study startup process. So tying into a lot of what we've talked about, um, another challenge is having that data in a lot of different databases um, and kind of a lack of visibility in real time to some of this information. So in um, these early phase oncology studies, there's a lot of data requirements. Um, it makes it a lot more efficient if you have that integrated data like a unified platform. So on the right of my screen here are the check marks of the must-haves in order to run a successful trial um, as a very basic guideline. So having a unified platform and that integrated data really helps because you can take into account um, after we've been talking about feasibility and, and um, insight selection um, and study startup process, but just past that point, we're really looking at then getting FPI. So patients are starting to come in. Looking at cohort management, you wanna do eligibility review. You wanna do that in a real time. You wanna see all of the central lab. Um, so the lab data points, there's usually quite a few in our first our phase one, first in human, complex oncology trials. So you wanna see all of that and have the real time tracking of that. So it helps on the site side, it helps on the sponsor side if you're looking at medical monitor review, et cetera. Um, so integrated data must have. Definitely. Um, then what we're also looking at is starting with the end in mind. We could be setting up um, these databases and these, the database meaning CTMS and obviously EDC, 
but looking at the data to be collected. We want to ensure that the sites know that we're trying to make it as efficient as possible for them. So um, not spending time on redundant data entry, only spending the time on the data entry that's required per protocol. We want to make sure that there's a good protocol review. We're keeping track of exploratory endpoints, especially in some of your earlier phase studies that you're looking at. But from the site standpoint, their engagement, making sure that the needs of, of these small companies are being met and the sites are excited to work on the study, we need to make sure that they're also being efficient with their time. So we talk about integrating that data, the visibility obviously, but also from the design standpoint and just the data entry and the requirements and the burden on the site staff to be able to do this. So if they're ever concerned about resources, let's make sure that it's efficient. So talking about data unified platform, but also really looking at an integrated team. So in, if you're working with a, a, um, a vendor, a CRO, you're looking for an integrated team. You want a clinical or project manager. They're really invested in the process. A lot of the times we see um, with some of these institutions running these types of studies, a lot of the times they have their specialized um, areas. They're looking at recruitment, um, and the feasibility. So instead of just a handover and a knowledge transfer to um, the project or clinical manager, then they're really invested in the process so that we can really have these sites excited and want to work on these studies with us. On the unified platform and the visualization of the data, um, examples like this are dashboards. So um, from our sponsor side, then we can log in by phone and see these statistics really easily. Um, a lot of these can be tailored to the site so they can view the information as well. And then obviously on the sponsor side. Integrated data. This is just an example of a report where all of the data is in the same place. So instead of logging into um, a lab vendor where you're reviewing either maybe it's even the paper printout versus logging into the portal to see um, the chemistry profile and the analyte, this can all be fully integrated into a system. So then from there, looking at your reference ranges and then correlating any of that to the adverse events. And then we can also see any cohort information and a, a lot of additional information in order to make a lot of informed, informed decisions. So talking about everything today, we're gonna touch on Axiom. So Fusion is your connected hub for all study data. We provide um, up to now about 30 modules that can be required for any study. Um, they're all available for single logon. Today, we've actually touched on a lot of the CTMS features. So talking about your feasibility, your study startup, um, really making that efficient, um, and, also see, and also getting the attention of these sites. And then we also have talked on uh, talked about a little bit more of these um, modules, but just keeping track that they're all uh, can't emphasize enough that single logon. Axiom provides um, a host of services and technology, and um, this is really great when we're talking about uh, going to our first in human studies. A lot of the times they're pretty budget driven um, in terms of moving forward with the study. So partnering with somebody like that, like Axiom is very beneficial because we can help to make those smart technology decisions. Um, we want everybody to be as efficient as, as possible and we're as invested in the product as, as you are. Along with our um, product, our proprietary software that we provide, we do have a host of services. Um, so just as Jazz has been talking about, that clinical management aspect, um, working very closely with the site. In addition to that, we have biostats, pharmacovigilance, um, safety, and uh, data analytics and data management. From Axiom standpoint, everything's available from a single logon, um, including all of the modules and the add-ons that may be chosen. There's a centralized dashboard to all of the critical data available to any type of end user that's um, accessing Fusion. So with that, we also have critical reporting across all the different types of data. So this reports out your CTMS data as well as the EDC data too. So why Axiom? We're definitely committed to the study success um, and we have a, a very data and strategy driven approach into everything that we do. 
Francisco. Thank you on behalf of myself and Jav. So thanks everybody for joining today. And uh, I do see a couple questions in the chat, so I'm just gonna go through those. Uh, so first question, you mentioned cohort management in your presentation. Can you further elaborate on a strategy to help manage this complex process? So I think uh, I can get started on this one, Jazz, and you can uh, help me out if you have anything additional. So when you're talking about cohort management, this definitely starts with the protocol, um, needs to be clearly defined and taking into account some considerations like subject replacements. Um, so DLT assessment duration may not be met. What are you going to do with um, these subjects that we now need to replace? So do you have a system in place? Is it clear to the sites? Obviously, starting with the protocol and then the training requirements as well. Um, as well as uh, the frequency of any SRC meetings, et cetera, would definitely help with the cohort management to kind of uh, be able to track and be able to fill those slots. And then I'm always going to advocate for an integrated system. So um, with that comes features such as wait lists and slot assignments. So there's a direct visibility for the sites and for obviously sponsors to be able to see is something coming up? Do we have some potential eligible place, uh, patients? So we start at pre-screening activities. We can identify if there's any potential patients. Um, so there's clear visibility into that kind of activity amongst all of the sites. Um, not that they're necessarily always competing for slot assignments, but we do need to make sure that we can get these patients in and we have a good system in place for that. So an integrated system really helps because from that we can start with um, the simple data entry. So if there's ePro requirements, if there's labs that need to go in. So when we want to talk about eligibility, everything's in the same place. So you're not signing into, of course, I'm always going to talk about it, 10 different systems to try to see and determine this these requirements. So um, a medical monitor can go in and review those um, eligibility packages uh, that they may have. But one thing that I do want to talk about is that, of course, we want an integrated system, but some sites, the way that they manage or they're used to doing some studies um, is a little bit um, uh, different or it's they, they're not able to necessarily adapt to some of these systems. So we do need to keep in mind that some of them are going to have those, those paper packages for enrollment and things like that. So um, when you really want to kind of go through the eligibility process and you want to be able to um, have that visibility, then systems are always great, but keeping in mind from the site's perspective, what are they also capable of? Do they have enough individuals to do the data entry in that time, et cetera? So the goal is minimize that data entry, have full visibility into anything that may be pending for um, slot assignments and, and visibility for your cohort management process could really help. Um, Jazz, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I think that's great. I, I think it's, it's one of the key things around cohort management among your sites is just communication is really key you know, it's not just getting those patients lined up, but when is the expected first dose expected to take place? Um, you don't want to necessarily take up a spot if the first, if that dosing is not scheduled for weeks away, um, because then you're losing that time. But yeah, thanks, Quinn. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, next question. So first patient in is always a challenge. What risks do I need to mitigate in order to be successful? And I'll let you start that one, Jess. Thanks, Quinn. Um, well, let's look at some of the risks to getting first patient in. One is um, you start off with your um, during the startup phase and you don't have enough sites selected in the first place. So um, let's say you needed 20 sites and, you know, there, there might have been a few sites that dropped out and now you're down to 18 or 17. That's going to pose a significant risk to getting your first patient in because you have that less of a pool of, of sites to choose your, your patients from. Um, so how do we mitigate that? Um, the rule of thumb is to have a 20% overage. So if you are uh, um, uh, planning for 20 sites, you have four to five sites in your backup pool so that in the event a site does end up dropping out for whatever reason, um, that backup site just takes over in that slot and you still are in, um, uh, you have that first patient in within your, within your line of sight and within your timeline. Um, another risk is not having a, a healthy site budget, for example. So while sites might, you know, go through the startup process, but then when it comes down to getting that first patient in and looking at their budget realistically, well, now they don't have the resources they needed to study coordinators to actually look through 
your patient database and, and find an appro appropriate patient. Um, so it really starts off with a really good healthy budget. Um, and then um, they're that much more ready to find your patients and get that first patient in um, by your timeline. Um, another one is, you know, let's say a patient, you, ha you have all of those risks and, and you've mitigated all of them and you've gone through all your sites up to site um, activation, but it's been 12 weeks, it's been 14 weeks since you had that, um, that qualification visit, that, you know, face-to-face -face interaction with your site. And now they've lost a bit of interest. Um, keep in mind, some of these sites might have a competing study that they've been working with, um, and now they have to choose. So engagement, have a really interactive um, site initiation visit, have frequent follow-ups so that they remain engaged and keep your trial in the forefront of their mind. Quinn, anything else I, I, you want to add? No, I think that's great. Thank you. And uh, just a couple minutes left for the last question. So how can we streamline the process of site identification selection using technology? Um, <clears throat> so in terms of the um, question, actually, it's kind of just a recap of, of some of what we talked about for sure. So using technology, having that database for sites where you can see right away lists of kind of no no go, go, who should we contact, who have we already contacted. Um, so limiting some of that redundant work. Obviously, I am not a fan of Excel manual trackers. Um, so after we come to the feasibility, then we're looking at electronically capturing all of the feasibility requirements. And then also what happens is, so if you're looking at feasibility and some of these sites aren't meeting these requirements, then you have a, a general visibility into what's not working. So um, we've seen some studies where we just have to tweak some of the way that some things are stored or um, some of the equipment that the sites have, and it's really common among all of them. So that also helps to streamline it because you can kind of like attack those items really quickly because you can see what are some of the common issues that we're looking at. So um, kind of starting from that and then when you get into the study startup phase, we already talked about using some study startup trackers electronically with all of the regulatory documents, their statuses tied directly to your ETMF. It's beautiful. Um, so it just makes it a lot more streamlined and easier. So. Um, I think that's probably about all we have for today. Uh, do you want to thank everybody for joining and thank you, Jazz, and have a great rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Thanks.